Welcome back to the Star Trek Las Vegas. I am your unofficial host, Heather Ferris, and I am joined today by Fred and Rocky. And we have an awesome panel for you, the Voyager panel. Everyone loves Voyager. I can't wait to see this. Shall we get to it? Get to it. Get to it. Let's get to this. Here we go. Engage. Make it so. Thanks, well, thank you for joining us. Kudos to you <laughs> for even being yeah, awake. Especially said. this one right here, huh? Did y'all hear him play last night? Just say it. Yeah. There it is. Mike's good? There you go. Can you hear Tim? Very good. We're good. Very good. good. Alright. So, let's say I wanted to start with current events for each of you, and I actually, ladies first, wanted to start with Roxanne. You just directed Breakthrough, which grows more than $50 million worldwide. So what were the challenges and the joys of directing a feature film for the first time, and how gratified were you by the great reaction to it? Well, I was very gratified by the reaction to it, and it was an extraordinary experience to be able to take something from its inception all the way to the very end, and then to see it received so well. So I was really happy. It just came out last week on uh, DVD and Blu-ray, and on the Blu-ray version there is um, a commentary uh, I'm doing the commentary on the whole film so you can get all the back uh, the behind the scenes uh, of the making of it and what happened in each scene. So it's a lot of fun to go through that version of it and it looks beautiful, if I might say, in the Blu-ray version. So if you can't watch it that way, it would be great. But um, see it any way you can. I think it's an important, impactful movie, very emotional, um, some beautiful, great performances. So um, based on a true story, so um, get to see it if you can get to see it in theaters. Um, I'm really proud of it. It's a really special film, everybody, so check it out if you haven't seen it. And then your three most recent directing credits, Roxanne, are The Americans, This Is Us, and Breakthrough. I mean, that's really the big time for any director. The question is, what do you do for an encore? What do you want to do that you've not done yet? Well, I'd like to do another feature because it was such such an extraordinary experience for me. Um, I'm about to work on the new Petty Dreadful. Are uh, any of you fans? Yeah. New Frank Spider. Yeah, it's going to be starting. Yes, it will be starting in uh, Los Angeles um, uh, soon. It all is all based on period in Los Angeles, the beginning of, of of LA. So it's going to have kind of a different theme from before. And then I go back and I do another. This is us for their next season as well because um, I just love it there and that cast is so extraordinary. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of what I want to do, another I would love to do another feature. So I'm trying to find one that speaks to me and, and that will be done, you know, like in the next few years because features take forever sometimes to make happen. So, um, but I'm excited. I'm excited right now about everything. That's and you know the next question. How interested would you be in directing one of the Star Trek shows? So there's a lot of Star Trek content coming up. I know, it really is. You know, and I've, I've been, I tried to fit it into my schedule this last year and wasn't able to, so I'll maybe look at the next year and see if there's something um, there with either Picard or, or Discovery. Um, I, I, Discovery has been extraordinary. I've been hearing from so many people. I saw the first, I was at the premiere and thought it was just fantastic, but I need to catch up on my Discovery viewing. And Picard is going to be amazing, amazing. So I'm looking forward to that. And Tim, let's move to you. You've been acting like a storm. We've seen you uh, recently on NCIS New Orleans. Woo! And you got to play guitar in it as well. We've seen you in the Orville. Uh, you were just in the Swamp Thing. How satisfying has your post Voyager acting career been for you? Uh, the acting career has been really uh, been great. The last year and a half got really busy, and uh, you can't predict any of those things. They just sort of run on autopilot. When they happen, they happen. And uh, I, and, I, and I have to agree with Roxy. I've just uh, I had a feature I directed released this summer uh, called Junkie, and uh, boy, that is a lot of work. Uh, the feature project is from beginning to end is a mile and a half of work. So uh, we we're very happy to have that done and working on pitching a series, uh, which is like a Marvel series type of thing, superheroes, with a production company that does Van Helsing series. So it's a project called Time Fighters. So we're hopefully we can get that. Uh, they're interested and they want to see the script, so we're presenting it to them. We'll see what happens. But. Um, the acting work is, is, it just comes, you know, it just comes and goes. It's like you've got an agent manager, they call you, and uh, sometimes it's a direct offer, sometimes it isn't. And you either work with them and, and do them, or, or you pass on one of the two. So, it's been good, it's been fun. 
So talk about that film that you just mentioned. What's uh, it about? Junkie, What's the setup? Uh, Junkie is uh, is a film that is about it's a, a woman is the lead character and she's in a small town. She's it starts out she's hooked on drugs and things nope. and selling herself in order to make the money for it. But something her brother is kidnapped by the people that she you know the drug dealer she deals with and she uh, you know forces herself off the uh, the junk and goes after. Uh, to find her brother and ends up encountering, you know, some very heavy, very bad guys, and uh, and she uh, she fights for her life. So it's a very cool story. It's a struggle story. So um, I had a female heroine as I were driving the whole thing. It's a very cool piece. Uh, enjoyed. I really enjoyed doing it. And you've been pursuing the directing for years and years and years at this point. I mean, really early on, right? Yeah. I mean, so we we all started uh, on Voyager. Uh, doing episodes of the show at the time, so we all sort of had that track, and uh, and, and so it's it, 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 again it's an ongoing thing, and it's also not those projects come by via uh, relationships. Uh, in some cases, it may be something that you put together yourself that you pitch, uh, or somebody comes to you and discusses wanting to have a work on it. So those are those. Uh, between those projects, it takes a long time. There's gaps, like uh, Roxanne said, there's gaps of time between those kinds of things, especially feature projects. And they just come when they come. And do you consider yourself a director actor at this point, or an actor? Oh, 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 about to take the show back to Broadway, and apparently she hit somebody on the crew, and they fired her. So, yeah, so the, the old joke, there was a movie where it was Frank Sinatra where she got killed, so the who done away with Fay is the... Uh, Seriously, what happened? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah, she slapped somebody. Wow. So. Now, and it wasn't scripted, I imagine. Uh, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> or she still be in the show? <laughs> you must not have had a, you must not have had a coffee that morning. There you go. But Tim, I was asking you, do you consider yourself a director, actor, or an actor director? Um, it is like a difference. You know, it's uh, it, it, some periods of time it can be one way, and other periods of time the other way. So, um, Which way do you prefer it? You know, it's I, I, it, 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 shooting. A pro, it's so different because shooting a project is, is, is Roxy will say is, is a, you're you're kind of you're, you're overseeing the whole thing. As opposed to an actor, you're just doing that one piece, and, and it's. I've been working in front of the camera for so many years that again, it's just something that it just comes and um, it's not. It's not any different than what I've been doing. Whereas if it's shooting or working behind camera, or writing, producing, or whatever it might be, that's a very different experience creatively. So uh, it, it's just not the same. There's two, two different things entirely. Uh, I enjoy both whenever they come along. Especially if it's an interesting role, and and and, and the, the roles that are in independent films, I found are the much much more rewarding and much more interesting to play, uh, as opposed to the television projects. Right. Uh, they, 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 uh, the, the independent film projects I've enjoyed. Uh, low budgets, yes, sometimes not a lot of money, but the roles are really interesting usually. So, prefer those. 
There you go. And Garrett, let's get to you. You've been moderating at a lot of conventions. You're podcasting. If I've got it right, you've got a clothing line as well, right? Uh, you know, I bring, I, well, I bring shirts to the con. All right. right. You bring shirts to the con. We'll call that. Thank you. Clothing. I just wanted to say, first of all, it's just amazing to have Roxanne here because she is truly the unicorn of Voyager actors. She's so busy. You never. Tim, I see all the time. Uh, we were at a convention just last week before this. We're at the front desk, and this young uh, reception, uh, receptionist at the front desk, she looks at Tim and says, oh, Principal Franklin from iCarly! <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's great. And she's just mesmerized with him, just looking at him. I go, you know he was awesome on Star Trek. She goes, oh, is that the one with the Ewoks? <laughs> no. no. Okay, sorry. Now, just what led you in the direction of each of these other things that you're doing? I've been taking time off from Hollywood. Um, I left in 2005, um, so I just had to fill in my time. So now um, I'm the Trek Track Director at Dragon Con. I do all the Trek programming there, um, moderating other actors. But I just signed with a manager about a month and a half ago, so it's been a 14 year break. I'm back, uh, finally. What do you now do? Three auditions, I booked one. FBI agent, something coming up, so yeah. Can you tell us what you're playing? No, no. no. But, so why now to return to acting? Um, it's been a long time, and then Crazy Rich Asians came out, and I realized that, hey, they're <laughs> casting a lot of Asians now. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked for me. In the, in, the, in the 90s, I was the only Asian series regular on television, right? Okay? I mean, you look at shows like ER and House, and you think, oh, there's definitely going to be an Asian doctor there, but no. You go to any Asian, you go to any medical school in this country, and you throw a rock, you're gonna hit an Asian on the head, right? Hey, I was an Asian, but Hollywood does not recognize that. I actually had a uh, dinner after booking Voyager. I, I had, a, I went to a small dinner party sitting next to Juliana Margulies, the head nurse from ER. We both congratulated ourselves for getting the roles on our respective shows, and then she said, "You know what? I actually had an issue." After I shadowed the head nurse at UCLA Hospital for three weeks, I realized that the ethnic makeup of our cast was completely wrong because there was no Asian doctor there. So she, she called up a meeting with the producers and she told them what was going on. And they said, oh, Juliana, thank God. We thought this meeting was called by you to tell, for you to tell us that you were pregnant. And now, you know, we had to recast and all this. And oh, thank man. God. So all your, your only concern is that? Well. ER set in Chicago, and that's why there's no Asian doctors, and you were at a UCLA hospital following the head nurse, which is completely <laughs> wrong, because my cousin is an Asian doctor at a Chicago hospital, so, I, you know, so the bottom line is, you know, Hollywood sometimes just can't get it right, right? So, to be the only Asian in the 90s, and now you see Asian faces in a lot of different projects, so it has moved forward a couple steps, so. Now, it's interesting, early on, I've known you for a million years, dating back to the beginning of the show. You would talk about how George Takei was an inspiration for you yes. and the only Asian face that you saw yeah. in television. Yeah. Now I'm hearing from other actors of Asian descent that they saw you on yeah. Voyager and that meant something to them. Take me through that. What well, does that mean to you? You know, it's for, for me, honestly, to see George Takei um, on reruns after school not speaking with an accent. Because at that time, I saw reruns of Star Trek and reruns of Bonanza. So now, what do you have on Bonanza? You have Hop Singh. Hop Singh is the Cartwright, um, you know, he does everything for the Cartwright family. Heavy accent, and then George Takei, um, wonderful resonant voice, right? It'd be totally different, he had a squeaky, like, you know, horrible teenager voice, whatever, but that would be, would not. I mean, I mean, that's a nice voice, I mean, you're like, yeah, right, you're into that, yeah. So, uh, it, it's, it's nice to have that role model, but I walked up to Patrick, the young man in Discovery, the Asian, Asian American, Asian Canadian young yeah. man. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, what's up? He's like, oh my God, when I was in university, I just, all I watched was Voyager. I watched you, you inspired me. So I'm like, oh, I'm your George Takei then. So, so it's kind of nice. Without the voice? Yeah, without the voice. But he's got his own distinct voice. Well, I'm just going to speak like George for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and then Garrett. Anybody, I don't know if you can see on the screen, but do you see the funny piece of jewelry on Garrett's hand? What? No. What is that? It's a promise ring. 
<laughs> you recently got married, right? Well, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a promise, Rick. Let's leave it's it. a promise. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Leave it at that. All right, all right. I'll go ahead. Almost married. Almost there you go. go. All right. Let, let, let's go back in time. If my research is correct, it was actually 25 years ago this week, Roxanne and Tim, that you guys were cast as Bellana and Tuvok, and then a few days later, Garrett, apparently you were cast. It was not a few days later. How much longer was it? It was probably three months later. These like I said, the three months two. later, I think you were cast. I was the last person other than the new uh, Jane How hard is it to believe that it's 25 years ago that this whole experience started for the three of you? Well, because my oldest daughter is 21, it's very easy for me to <laughs> figure out. You've got a literal clock in front of you. Know, and also, she was born on January 16th, which was our premiere day. So she was what? born a few, yeah. Was she born on 16th? Yeah, January 16th, which was the day, so it basically a few it years ago to, yeah, prepare me for childbirth is what the shit did. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy that it's been that, yeah, that yeah. long. Quarter of a century. Yeah. Quarter of a century. Yeah. Yeah. When you put it that way, especially. Yeah. It is. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you don't. You don't know, really. It's. It's hard to. Uh, at least for me. I. 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 I the concept of time. I mean, uh, it is just, it goes by in such a rate. I don't think Einstein was aware of that he was putting this theory of relativity together because, uh, you know, 10 minutes, uh, you know, 10 minutes is, or I said 10 months is like 10 minutes. It just, to me, it just doesn't feel like that long a time has gone by, but it has. I mean, numerically, that's exactly what has happened. It's amazing. It really is wrong. Like the Voyager episode, Blink of an Eye. Blink of an Eye. Blink of an Eye. How about you, Gary? Uh, how, how crazy is it that it's 25? Uh, well, I mean, it's funny because I was like the youngest, other than Jennifer Lean uh, cast, I was the youngest person in that cast. And now, I turned 50 last year, so it's like, what? Yeah. You're poor? Yeah, 50. Um, it was weird to me when you just said the young man is on Discovery. I'm like, you were the young man who was on Voyager. Come on. I know. Where did it go? It's 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 scary. I mean, I, I people have come up to my table and say, wow, what time machine have you you know been utilizing? Because they say that you look still pretty young, and I'm like, oh, I've got a lot of gray hairs that are all hiding amongst the other black that you see here. So it has changed. Yeah. And then a question I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times, but it's worth asking again today. How long did it take for each of you to find your character, to really grasp how he or she fit into the larger picture? I thought you were going the makeup way. How no, long did it take no, you to put the makeup no, on? I, 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 an no, I know better than that. <laughs> I, I got the memo from your agent. I'm not asking you. Do not ask that. <laughs> What is the question again? <laughs> How long for, did it take you to get into your character or to establish your character as, as Taurus? Oh, not long at all, because I have that side of me that's so really mean and tough, and I should just go, okay, you get to use that side. <laughs> but I couldn't take that home to my husband at night, so I would get it all out of my system in the daytime, and then be very nice when I got this night. Um, no, I loved Valana. I loved stepping into her character. It was just, it was fun. It was like, you know, kind of a badass, fun, you know, energetic. It was great. I mean, it didn't take me long, I don't think, to get into that. The forehead, accepting the teeth that we eventually got rid of, thank God. Um, you know, that, that took a little bit of time. But, I mean, just getting used to that, wearing a prosthetic on your head and kind of filling that, you know. But, the character itself, you know, I felt was very identifiable to me. Me too. Yeah, you know, um, it is no secret that uh, uh, each of the cast members that you saw on the screen uh, do have some of the personality traits of those characters already built in. That is absolutely some of the traits. You are Vulcan. Uh, really. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. So the the reach is not that great to get there. Uh, the key is just the writers putting together the, uh, the backstories for the characters as they uh, progress. I just use the basic template of what this Vulcan character should be like, the walk and talk. If it was a Ferengi, there would be a walk and talk that you have to do to, you know, to sell that character, just to get it going on the runway. So that's what I did. And I had a lot of, you know, whether, whether it was Nimoy or a few other Vulcan characters, just to base them on, just to get them started. And then from there, rely on the writers to come up with the stories to the flesh them out. So it was not hard for me at all. Hey, we trained as actors for years to learn how to show emotion. I get to work seven years with somebody who doesn't show any emotion. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I just, <laughs> Tim. I love you, Tim. You're just so, you're such a Vulcan in real life. It's awesome. 
I met him for the first time. I was like, hey, you know what? Tuvok, you changed one letter. You could have been Tupac. He did not laugh at that at all. He just stared at me blankly. And then he said, kind of like rap. Now. Yeah, like now. Rap music. <laughs> rap music is the reason for the fall of modern Western civilization. I said, that's a Vulcan response if I've ever heard it. Oh my God. Uh, now, just referring back to, to Roxanne, um, she. This is very funny. We used to do this thing on the bridge where all the guys oh, no. in Voyager would walk up to each other <laughs> and we would pat each other on the butt like uh, NFL football players would say, we'd say, good job, we'd pat each other on the butt. So we did this constantly on the bridge and we would do it to the gals too, like Janeway would be in, you know, she'd be okay with it. But then whenever we were, Roxanne was working with us, Robbie McNeil and I were like, no, no, you go do it, no, you go do it, I'm not going to pat it because we were all afraid. And then we pat her on the butt, our fingers would be broken. And like that. So we all had fear, literal fear, that the Klingon would come out and kill us. So, you know. Had it once, is that what scared you? Was that? Had it once, that it's what scared you to never do it again? Well, no, no. Or you just, just were scared? Just, no, we were just scared it's of Roxanne. fear of the unknown. But yeah, you were all afraid of Roxanne. It was fear of the unknown. It's like she wasn't on the bridge. She worked in engineering mostly. And when she, she did come on the bridge, right, she was just, she played her role so well. We were afraid of her. I mean, they, no one would touch yeah. Roxanne's bum. It was like, no, we can't do it. No, we can't do it. We will die. Yeah. We, we always overdid it. But, and, and, and you don't want to catch four or five of us in the turbo lift at the same time. Not a good thing. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we never, I'm, I'm surprised we could ever get a scene with us all spilling out of that thing because we're in there just goofing off. Just, the just the, but here's the thing, as much as we goofed off, the minute they said tape, speed, action, action we went action. right into professional Absolutely. mode. Right. Right. We'd be mid-laughter and then, <laughs> okay, <laughs> acting like that. We, do it. we did it. We got we it done. Do it. It, right? it the briefing room was the toughest one. Briefing I was a tough one. Or any director coming oh, in. Oh, definitely. We, we hadn't seen each other in a long time, and everybody was gathered in the briefing room. Yeah. We had to do these scenes, and yeah. They, yeah. they had to basically fit the scenes in between our catching up with each other. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, <laughs> Like, and the briefing room was like the oh, was the kiss of death. Every time they brief, oh my God, we're there for yep. three or four pages. The most horribly, you know, because for us, and it, you know, it's it's just one of those. But not we had to have it, but the scenes were so tedious and long, and yeah. because there's so many angles they had to cover. And so yeah, we were. Oh, yeah, we would give them time. I'm telling you, they had to pull the walls out, right? Uh, the walls pull it out. Just, uh, it was just it was just horrible. We know that day was going to be long. It was the briefing room, well, not the briefing room again. Yeah. yeah, we want to be running around on. Alien planets on stage 16, and they will. Well, you guys got to run around. Kim was always left on the bridge. It's just like, hey, and so Kim, the bridge is yours. Well, but you guys get to wear normal clothes. Oh, no, man, I wanted to do the. I wanted to do the uh, the one the the black and white. Uh, uh, black Captain Proton. Yeah, yeah. You didn't get to do Proton. No, I oh, was, I was always on the bridge. I was like, oh, oh, you put me in I didn't either. I don't think. You didn't do Proton. I don't think they, uh, oh they no. Get to I was okay, well, listen guys, I was at a con with Robbie McNeil, he turns to the audience, he goes, Hey guys, this is my Robbie, what do you think if uh, I shot six minute episodes and did a YouTube uh, Captain Proton series? What do you think? And they're like, ah! And then he does that, then you guys can come in. I love that. That'd be awesome. Such a cool piece. I can't believe it's you guys so much fun. Anything. By the way, Garrett does impressions of everybody in the cast except, except. for one person. Yeah. Roxanne. <laughs> He's intimidated you by you. You, can't, you, can't, wait, wait, you can't do Roxanne. I cannot do Roxanne. That is true. I cannot do Roxanne. Wow. Oh, because, you know, I mean, everyone, at, like, for instance, Picardo, his voice is so, you know. Just remember, kids, anybody can start a in a big match, but the real action comes in sick bay. So, I mean, he's very building up and down. So, I mean, I mean <laughs> Captain, that's easy too, right? You guys, it, it's, they're very specific and particular kind of voices with uh, interesting qualities, but Roxanne's is almost impossible. See, I'm interesting qualities. Yeah, Roxanne has a very boring, boring voice, and it's very difficult to do it. Fighting words. Can't do it. Ooh, that was fighting words. Fighting <laughs> words. Turning serious for a moment. Many fans loved Voyager, obviously. There's tons out here right now. And my question to you is, to your thinking, how much has the passage of time helped turn the critics into Voyager fans? Oh my god. There's, I always meet fans that are like, I was a diehard TNG, I resisted watching Voyager, I just binge watched on Netflix last month, I mean literally 
year, decades later, and they're, I love it now. So, yeah, it's awesome when they come around to Voyager and realize that, you know what, we rocked it. We did. So, I have to go. said they didn't like it and just that they some of them have preferences whether it's ds9 or whether it's uh, tng which is fine I, I know you know i don't i don't watch everything that's out there either man there's you know uh, so it's it's perfectly okay with me if they have a preference for one of the three or they're all different shows yeah casts and all that so yeah. and now they have the new ones to like or dislike yeah right, right. two of them wow. you know what i always find funny guys you ever have this someone comes up and says you know what fifth favorite character in Star Trek. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of a compliment because there are so many. Yeah, there's so many Star Trek, so I might be number one in Voyager. Roxanne, <laughs> <laughs> your thoughts on that? The, the fans consider. Yeah, you know, well, well, it's interesting. I'm still getting. Um, sometimes I'll go on to a, a crew, you know, and, and I'm shooting something, and they'll come up to me like in a low whisper voice, goes, "I just watched you last night. I've been watching Voyager." You know, what I mean, it's, it's like it's so funny. But all it's always in whispers. It's very funny. It's like they don't want to reveal that I had another life. You know. Right. Um, but but a lot of people watch it, and their kids are watching it. I think I just got something. I'm not on. Twitter that much, but in fact, you're the one who convinced me to go on Twitter. You I were did. Totally responsible. I am the reason that. why you're on Twitter. Oh, so. No, you were the you were the reason. Yeah, yeah. you did not want to do it. Okay. Um, but anyway, there was somebody who was um, said that uh, my character inspired them, and they've gone into science, and yep. and it was just an amazing thing, you know. And they actually pursued that because of the influence that my daughter, actually my oldest daughter, is um, a scientist, and she did not. I know it's Everyone in my lab wants to meet you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is really kind of funny, but she's yeah, she's um, she's working in um, cancer research and DNA, and she's right now at MIT, and she's like she's yeah, so she's moving in, in that direction. And I can't say that I had anything to do with that. I mean, but uh, I'll take the credit. But I mean, no, she's um, so she in a way is sort of carrying on Bolana's mission, I suppose. If you want to look at it through Star Trek. Glasses. <laughs> I did not know she was doing that. The last time I remember seeing that daughter was at Kate Mulgrew's uh, St. Patrick's Day party, where and she's wearing that and hat. I, I and have video dancing. of her remember dancing. Remember, she's dancing. Yes, I have video. And now she's a scientist. And now great. she's a scientist. Yeah, that's great. I love it. I'm going to open it up to questions in one minute. But Tim, I just wanted to ask about this. What is? Was this on your trailer door? Uh, a million years ago. I don't remember that actually. Can uh, you guys see this? It, it, may, I, it may have been. I, I had done, um, I was in an extra in an episode of Voyager with you. Oh my goodness. And uh, so we went to do the interview afterwards in your trailer, and this was on your door at Paramount. That, so that is uh, entirely I'm wrong. on the edge with darling Tim Ross's official Vulcan. I just thought it was the funniest thing. Somebody must have done it for you. And Somebody you slapped it on your door, door, and yeah. I didn't know if it was a full-time thing or no, an inside I, joke. Or I, I, I could, I have no idea, but I would not be surprised. There you go. All right, let's open it up to the fans. One Very good. Start on the left. I can't see. Is there anybody? There we go. Thank you. Ooh. Hi. Uh, so this question is for Roxanne. First of all, thank you so much for coming this year. It's so exciting to see you. Um, so I grew up in East LA, and didn't have a lot of representation of women of color, particularly we didn't see a lot of Latino women on television. And now we're seeing things like Vida. I've been really excited to watch Vida. It's been thrilling for me. And it does seem like there is a change in representation in front of the camera. So it's kind of wondering if you felt that there was a similar change behind the camera, or and and you know if there's still a lot of work to be done. How that feels for you as a someone who's doing directing now. There's been a huge change in front of the camera. I remember growing up, and, and like you, Garrett, I never saw anybody that looked like me on TV. And when I went out to audition, the only thing I would audition for were either you know, uh, gang members or drug addicts. And the, the, those were the auditions for uh, you know, a woman of uh, Puerto Rican descent. Um, and I had to speak in some heavy accent, which I didn't do very well. Um, but now I realize there really there is such diversity. If you look at Voyager too, just we kind of before it was even popular. I mean, look at what we did with the female captain and yeah. look at the diversity in our cast as leading the way on television. I mean, really, if you look at now we did it all without shining a light on it, without going, hey, look how diverse we are. You know what I mean? We just did it. 
And we just had that female captain. Nobody questioned it. It was just what we did, you know, which is really great. Behind the scenes, that's another, that has been a, a battle. I've been directing now for 20 years, which is kind of unbelievable to me. But um, when I first did, people would come up to me and go, oh, I can't believe we have a female director, you know, and it was all very new and, and odd. Right now, there's a movement towards really finding um, females and employing them behind the scenes, um, in camera, um, directing, in all sorts of areas behind the scenes. And I think it's a double-edged sword, if I could just be really honest, because I think that right now, sometimes um, I'll go in for jobs and they don't know whether I'm hired because I'm a, I'm a female and just filled, you know, checked a box or because I'm actually worthy of it. Um, and I think a lot of females are dealing with that. And I think that's the pendulum swinging a little bit too far in one direction where you're checking boxes versus finding the people, you know, that really deserve to, to, be, doing, to be doing that. So, but I think it'll swing back. And I think that we're find that this, this kind of movement towards diversity, it's just, it's just happening naturally because that is the way of the world. Just look around, you know? And I think that it's becoming more accepted without it being an issue. And that's the goal, right? Isn't it? Being accepted without being an issue. Great question. Thank you. Let's go to Brian. Oh, my. Hey. Tim and Garrett, you're both heavily involved in the fan films, which I love, and I see them as a way to keep the Trek spirit alive during those years where we didn't have any new TV shows, any new movies. I don't think they take any money away from the studio. I think they help stu the studio because it keeps people watching. And as fans, a lot of us have watched the TV shows and movies a million times we're always looking for new content. And I appreciate what you all do. And how do you feel about this crackdown and lawsuit against the fan films and what's been done? Uh, well, the, the, uh, at the time that, that we worked, I think there was uh, the producer, Sky Conway, was the one who actually was the muscle and the, the movement behind all that stuff. And he had reached out to us to, you know, to take your cameo roles and then do that kind of thing at the time. And, and uh, I, it, those. Those projects are not, because it's, it's intellectual property, and that's what it comes down to, that the track is owned by uh, the studios, and, and we're copywritten. You can't, you can't put those, you technically would not be able to put those on if they are producing their own uh, projects. So, uh, and, and yeah, at the time, I, 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 I pointed that out and asked him, I said, are you sure you're able to, you really want to do that because it's intellectual property somebody else owns and that's just the, that's just the way things are you know um, and it would be you know because the, the producers were so adamant they thought that the, the fan base was very you know still wanted to have it they just did it anyway so uh, there's nothing I can there's nothing you can say or do uh, I was already aware of, of the perils of going on that road and try to do it so uh, and, and at the time I was uh, to just ask me to work on it or I was hired to do it so uh, I don't have any I'm not in the position of having to deal with all the, the legal stuff, but that's, I told them ahead of time, I said, you guys may want to reconsider that, because you can't, technically, you can't. Uh, uh, certainly cannot sell anything commercially like that, because you don't own it. <coughs> I remember when uh, Tim called me up, he was directing uh, Star Trek of Gods and Men, he says, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm directing an independent Star Trek film, and it's uh, my Tim Russ. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was wondering if you, uh, you want to act in it. And I said, this is right after Voyager was done. I said, absolutely not. And then he said, he goes, you're going to be playing a character completely opposite of it, so you're kind of a bad guy. And I said, sign me up right now. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you got me. You got it. Thank, Thank you, though. Thank you. Go back to the left. Hi, my question was for Ms. Olsen. I watched Voyager as a teenager and I saw myself a lot in Moana and actually I loved engineering but it actually encouraged me to look into fields like that. So I was wondering how you felt about young women seeing you and seeing that character and going into engineering and science because of that. That's great. Well, I, it touches my heart. Like, <laughs> you can't know, it really does. I think it's such an important field and it's so ironic too that just with knowing that my daughter has gone into, you know, the sciences. Um, I, I see how important it is. I see through her eyes how she's as passionate about science as I was about theater when I was a kid. And you used to talk to my mom about Shakespeare and Chekhov, and her eyes would like cross, you know. And um, and now my daughter knows me about mitochondria and RNA, and my eyes cross, you know. But, uh, but 
but she talks with that passion, and I think the passion for the sciences, and now, and she even talks about how she was the only, she right now is the only female in her um, lab back at UCLA, because another one just graduated, and more and more, they're now starting to, to see women, in, that, that we have brains too, and that we can actually be in the sciences, and so you see this happening, I think, in every field, and it is, fundamentally exciting because th there's been so there's been such a wealth of talent that hasn't that's been looked over over the years whether it be because of, of of your race or your sex or whatever now i think the world is really opening its eyes so i'm very touched that um, that you were inspired by by her and um by Bologna, and I, I hope others were too and will continue to be inspired by all that star trek does for the sciences but I do have a degree in theater and film and I've done some directing, but I'm finding that whereas an actor I can make choices and have the confidence to do so when I become in a director role, it's much more difficult for me to have that same confidence. And I was just curious um, how you make that transition from actor to director, and even more so, how do you do that when you're directing an episode of a show you've been in and are even in that episode for? Uh, on Voyager, both of us directed the episodes, uh, an episode here and there uh, on the show, and it was actually, for me, pretty easy. Uh, these guys, you know, the episode I directed came, they brought it, man, it was amazing. And I, and I was pleasantly surprised because we had to play the roles uh, of, our, of the characters that were not normally there. They had to play the evil versions of themselves. And they, man, it was, it was intense. They, they brought everything so in, in, incredibly cool that time. I had no concerns really about whether or not if, you know that was going to be a difficult issue. It was not. It was other things that had the headaches about. But other, they were amazing in uh, that transition. I think that Roxy, I don't know, you felt the same way. You directed us in episode. You had to be in as well. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I find it harder to direct an episode that I'm in. Yeah. yeah, it's just, um, some people love that. I just did, um, worked on the series finale of The Deuce, and James Franco uh, had directed a few of the episodes and directed some very difficult episodes, and he loves directing when he's in it. I, I find it very, very difficult to do that because there are two parts of your brain. Somebody brought it up earlier one time, you know, you're dealing with, you, just, you said like one piece of the pie, and then you're dealing with the whole pie, you know? So it's, um, I find it difficult to change hats. But when we directed on Voyager, it was a wonderful introduction to directing because they wanted us to succeed, the whole cast, the crew, you know. And then you get into the real world and it's not the same. And then it's difficult. And then I have to say to you, there's a certain bit of faking it until you make it. In other words, you have to get into these positions and even if you don't have the courage and you feel weak need, you know, that's when your acting comes into play, right? And you step up and you go, I am a director and I can do this, you know? And then you go home and cry, don't cry on the set. <laughs> okay, but it really is, there's a certain amount of, you know you've got to learn things and the only way for you to learn it is to get out there and do it and to own it and to pretend until, you can, until you're not pretending anymore. One day you just wake up, wow, I actually do know this, you know? Well, typically when you guys are directing on Voyager, when you were acting in the scene, did you have a uh, first AD watch the monitor to see if every? Did you guys have someone watch you? Yeah, you have to have somebody. Uh, take Marvin, you know, did you Marvin did it. Yeah, Marvin did it. Marvin Rush. Yeah. But she, uh, she, I, I, I don't like being in the projects. I don't like shooting. Uh, I, to me, it's, it's distracting. It's really distracting because you like she said, you got to take this hat off. You're not, you know, you're, 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 you're at that moment in time. It's like, oh yeah, I got to get the makeup. Oh yeah, I got to figure out what my lines are. Oh yeah, I got to. It's always that it's in the back because you're not focused on all that. And if somebody asks you to be in a project and shoot it, I usually try to dissuade them from that. Uh, you know, I think you know there'd be somebody else better. Here, yeah. let's get somebody else. Let's hire that actor. I don't want to do it. Yeah, two I, feet, two boats. I and, and she's right. Some people like Clint Eastwood. A whole bunch of folks like to like a whole film, man, where they're the lead in it. I don't, I don't understand that, and I, I, I can't do that. I'm not even close to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hey there. Hi guys, good to see you. Um, 
So we talked a lot about how you personally and your characters have all inspired us. So I'm curious who inspires you? Who is one person you've always wanted to have a conversation with? You may have stumped us. Look at that. <laughs> From something completely out of the ordinary. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, okay, so I, I fell in love with sci-fi um, when I saw the original Star Wars in the theaters in 1977. So uh, I've always been a huge Harrison Ford fan, and that's who I always wanted to, to be able to talk to. And the funny thing is, when I got the role on Voyager, I was told that I had to rush to Paramount Studios to go to wardrobe to get fitted in my for my, my Starfleet uniform, and I was on the other side of town, and when I got up to the front gate, the security guard uh, that was at the gate, I had, I'd known him after my six, six auditions for the role, and he had, uh, I bet him a case of beer that I wasn't gonna get the job, and he goes, you owe me a case of beer, and then I said, I'm late for a fitting. So he says, okay, we'll just drive, uh, just you know, just go in that, that parking lot over there, and I'm, just, I'm hauling ass around the corner, and all of a sudden, there, there's a guy in a suit walking between two cars, and I slam on my brakes, and I almost, I mean, I'm within six inches of taking this guy's legs out. And you know, when you almost have an accident, your heart's beating like crazy, and I can tell this guy's heart's beating like crazy. I lock eyes with him. It's Harrison Ford. I'm going, holy moly, I almost killed my idol. And I thought about the papers the next day, you know. Young Star Trek actor maims Harrison Ford. Young Star Trek actor kills Harrison Ford. Han Solo, Indy, dead because of Garrett Wong. And, I, and the thing was, the, the next day in the trade papers, um, Harrison Ford was going to this, the screening, the premiere of Clear and Present Danger was the uh, film that he was going to. That's why I was in the suit and everything. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Can you your that? idol. That is, that is amazing. That could be the title of the film. Idol. Idol. That'll be my autobiography title. How's that? Um, you know, you know, I I wasn't ever looking for anybody that looked like me because there wasn't anybody that looked like me. But I, mean, I was a huge fan of Catherine Hepburn, Audrey Hepburn, all of those stars in those movies that get strong female that you know can talk their men down and <laughs> so any Hepburn, different any Hepburn, apparently. <laughs> You know, probably one of the reasons I love Kate so much. Um, but, you know, those were kind of my idols. Um, I have to go back. Um, the writer, H.G. Wells, I would have loved to have had a conversation with him. Um, Such a full connector. Well, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy the genre of science fiction, and he was a visionary. And uh, I love his stories. The Time Machine, oh my God. Um, War of the Worlds, I and mean, I would have loved to have I sat down and have a conversation with him because he's a futurist, he's a visionary, and, and, and the concepts and things he comes up with are absolutely amazing. So I would, I would like to have a conversation, if I could, with H.G. Wells. I thought he was fascinating. That'd be great. Right. I, I gotta end this. You're about to play, so I'm gonna let one more question. Please make it just a question and really short, and guys, we're gonna get played off, so quick answers. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you all for coming. Roxanne, really quickly, one of my favorite Voyager episodes was Lineage, when you uh, had to uh, deal with the fact that your child might uh, look, uh, have his uh, Klingon ancestry, the look of the child, I mean of, of the Klingons, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make this quick. And I love Discovery, but I'm hoping that Picard and Discovery will get back to topical subjects like that, uh, because um, Star Trek does it the best uh, with making us think about what's going on uh, in our world, and we have a lot of uh, <coughs> things going on in our world today. And I'm hoping Star Trek will get back to that. And also, I was wondering, did you have any input in that episode? Um, I did have some input in that episode, and it actually is one of my absolute favorite episodes, and it's one of the few ones that I showed to my daughters as well. Um, and it's ironic that my oldest daughter is actually dealing with genetics and genetic alteration, and that's exactly what she's dealing with in, in her life right now. Um, I think it's really important, and I think ultimately Star Trek will get back to those themes. Um, uh, and because that is what Star Trek is about, you know, and I think that the more the fans um, sort of demand that and ask for it, and, you know, pure Star Trek will always challenge us and inspire us, right? And we are back. We hoped you liked that panel. I know I did. Did you guys like that? 
It was awesome. Yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm a big Voyager fan. Yes, yes. me too. Yes. Totally. And when Kate Mulgrew walked on stage, Beautiful. oh my god, I that was a great died. fun surprise. And she didn't stick around. She went and back away. She's around. got books to sign. I know, right? But uh, <laughs> it's fun to see her pop on and say hi to everybody. Yeah. But she did have her own panel too. So. Yeah, that's yeah. true. So, yeah. What I was excited about was to see Roxanne on this. I've never me seen too. her in person, and uh, I am a huge fan of this woman. Not because of Bolana Torres. Not that I didn't love Bolana. I loved Bolana Torres. <laughs> But um, I, I think for Klingon chicks, I don't know what it is. But um, <laughs> especially if they're engineers, that's a very important thing to make. The engineers. So uh, Juan is perfect for you. Yeah, perfect for me. <laughs> Friggin' Tom Harris, though. Um, but anyway, um, the, she is a director, and she's been doing stuff for a long time now. We've seen her name pop up on shows, uh, but she's been doing movies. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited to see this movie. I'm gonna just see it yet, but. Um, I like her work, and I want to see it. And it was cool to get her there in person. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. And um, I thought it was fun too when they started talking about uh, Tim Russ and how he had never been on a Captain Proton uh, episode. <laughs> it's like really? He's like, nope. I was always on the bridge. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are you gonna do? You leave the Vulcan on the bridge. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. Someone's gotta mind the store. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing I thought. Um, Roxanne pulled up was uh, being Latino yeah. and having to be that Latino character mm -hmm. versus whatever you want to do. Um, you don't want to be the, the gangster chick or the, um, uh, well, I can't remember the other, dem the other ones, but it was like, you know, you get typecast because you're a certain gender or uh, race mm -hmm. and it's a horrible thing that was going on at the time. Right. And uh, it was refreshing to get her on the show. Yeah, and they were saying too, um, she, it was very hard for her to have a role model because you just didn't see anyone like her on TV when she was growing up. Correct. And Garrett Wong said something similar to that where the only Asian that he had to look up to was um, um, Sulu. You're right. You know? And the cool thing about that, um, so he could look up to, to George Takei and get that reference, but the thing we find out later is... Um, one of the actors from Discovery looked up to Garrett yes. for his reference yes. mm -hmm. uh, as an Asian actor. And I was just, that's awesome. Yeah. It's so good. It's, we're seeing, you know, we, we talk about these trends that are going wrong and we want to fix them. This and is this is one that we are actually fixing. Yes. This is happening. Seriously. So that's exciting and fun to hear. Yeah, I yeah. completely yeah. agree. So it's like one crew is serving as role models for... I mean, it literally yes. becomes generations and we are improving over the generations. And that's a beautiful thing. However, um, his impersonation of Sulu. That was awesome. <laughs> also great for different reasons. <laughs> but um, yes, exactly what you guys were talking about. And they were saying that Roddenberry, when he envisioned Star Trek, he envisioned um, a complete, uh, uh, just... Everybody, every type of person on the cast. A melting pot. Well, but we're not making a deal of it. It's just yeah. they're there. They're doing their jobs and that's it. How it should be. That's they're exactly people. how it should you know? be. Yeah. I love that about Star Trek. That's yeah. one of the best things about Star Trek. Or just kind of take it for granted. And it doesn't matter who you are as long as you're doing what you need to do. Exactly. Yeah. And you can do it. Exactly. It doesn't matter who you are, you can do it. And we need more of that in TV shows. Yes, we do. I mean, not just Star Trek, but just every TV they show. They were picking on billboards with a bunch of white guys. And like, it sucks. It's not like, this guys, we don't need this. Yeah. We can actually fix this. This is yeah. something we can fix now. I know that when I watch TV shows and if I see an all-white cast, I sort of get put off by it. You know, I don't want to see that. I want to see reality, you know, and that's not reality. We need reality. We need um, more people involved. On a sci-fi show. On every show. On every show. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. No, this it's, it's, it's was great to hear this panel. It was uplifting. Definitely. So. Great. And then um, one more thing before we go, uh, and let me know if you guys want to go in. Um, I thought it was funny that they said that Garrett was the reason why Roxanne is on Twitter. I just thought that was hilarious. You know what? I remember that too, because she got on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, she's on Twitter. Yes. And it was his fault. It's he was it's on. The reason. He was on before she was. He was one of the early ones that popped on Twitter that I'm following. I'm like, oh, yeah, I gotta yeah. follow these guys. Yeah. So yeah. thank you, that, Garrett. That was kind of funny. Yes. <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so that pretty much does it for me. How about you guys? Did you want to add anything else before we wrap up? Just love Voyager. Yeah, yeah love just, Voyager. just a great yeah. cast and crew. And they are so fantastic. Voyager is a great series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that pretty much does it. Thank you so much for watching the panel. Thank you so much for joining us in this commentary. And let's go to the next panel. So join us on the next one.